Have you ever been asked the question or have you ever been through the process of saying, I need to find a church. Can you help me find a church? Well, how do you go about finding a church? What is a church? What is the purpose of a church? And nowadays, if you ask that in the United States of America, people would say, well, what's your problem? I mean, there are churches all over the place. Just look for a steeple. Well, newer churches, they don't necessarily put steeples on them. The architecture may have changed. Well, look for a building. And then others would say, well, look for a sign out in front, such and such church. Others will say, look for the music or the bells and the chimes. And others will say, well, go look for this. And there are certain things that people look for in a church. I sat down with one couple, and they were talking about looking for a church. They said, well, we want a church that has this, and we want a church that has that, and we want a church that has the other. We want a church, and it goes through this whole list of things. I said, well, but you know what was not on that list? Most of the things that are going to be on the list that we're going to look at today. Sometimes we call church things that are not churches. And I'm going to make a strong statement here, and I want you to bear with me because the passage will bear it out, okay? But I want you to understand the meaning, and I'll explain the meaning of what I'm going to say. Churches that don't meet Christ's description of a church are satanic churches. So, wow, you, that, that is harsh. That is judgmental. No. It, in fact, Jesus said that very, very same thing in this passage. Churches that do not follow the purpose of God, and he will lay out the first mention of the church in the New Testament. He's preparing the disciples to become apostles, and they will then be there in Acts 2 to begin the church. Well, as he prepares them, he gives them a description and even in this process, when Peter, who was complimented in earlier verses, is now Jesus turns to him and says, Get thee behind me, Satan. One of his own disciples were called Satan. Why? Because they opposed the purpose and plan of God. And there are many churches out there today that do not preach the scriptures. They do not live in such a way as to fulfill the purpose and plan of God. And that makes them an adversary or an opposition to the purpose of God. We can't just go out and start a church under our own authority, under our own means, under our own wisdom. That's the whole purpose of Matthew 16. We need the wisdom of God and we have to have discernment. Those religious leaders in verses 1 through 4, they did not have the discernment to even recognize the Messiah, although they were the most expert in all of Israel on Old Testament law. The Old Testament law and prophets. And they didn't recognize him. They rejected him. They crucified him. So how do we today find a church? We're in a different dispensation. We're in the dispensation of the church now, dispensation of grace. We don't no longer go to one temple to worship. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, 1 Corinthians 16, 9, 6, 9 and 12, 19, 20. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. He dwells within us. So is the church a building? No. Is the church a name? No. Is the church a denomination? No. Is, there, is the church a program? I mean, they have to have Sunday school. They have to have a youth meeting. They have to have, No. In fact, you're not going to find any of those things in this passage. There are certain foundations for what a church must be and must, qualities it must have in order to be a church. Well, we see this pivotal point in verse 21, as we mentioned. From this point forward, Israel has rejected as a nation, and spiritually speaking, the spiritual leaders have rejected Christ as the Messiah. We saw that in chapter 12. Chapter 13, he postpones the millennial kingdom, and he implements the kingdom of heaven that is described as beginning at that point, going until the end of the tribulation at the second coming. So the church will be raptured out seven years earlier, but that kingdom of heaven still persists through that time because the parable of the wheat and tares there in Matthew 13, it describes the second coming events. So that's how long the kingdom of heaven will, this intermediate kingdom he's describing, will go. 
So what do we do? The church is right there. The vast majority of that is the church. In fact, all but about eight or nine years of the kingdom of heaven will be the church age. So we play an integral part of that. And as we do, we have to understand what a church is. The word church in the Bible is the word ecclesia. Ek means out, and ecclesia is the called ones, to call out. So we are a group, an assembly that is called out from what? From sin, from the flesh, from the world, from those things that are alien to the Lord. We're called out of that to worship the Lord. So we are a group of called out ones. We cannot be born again believers in fellowshipping with the Lord and be walking in the flesh and walking hand in hand with the world and doing the things of the world. You cannot honor God and the world at the same time. They are diametrically opposed. They're an antithesis one to the other. So we will be lights in darkness. We will be salt in this world. And that's the qualities there in Matthew 5, verses 13, 14, I believe it is, that God wants from us. So what will be the quality of this called out assembly? Well, there's going to be 10 things. Will we achieve them all today? Well, did you bring a lunch? I can't multiply bread. I've tried it, but it just gets smaller and smaller when I do it. But uh, anyway, we will go as far as we can. I don't want to rush it. In fact, as I mentioned in the previous hour, my desire would be to come back in some time in the future and take each of these ten things and preach one message at least on each of the ten because it warrants it. What we're going to have here in a just a, a topic format, a PowerPoint, so to speak, format, is these 10 elements, and others, they'll pull out seven, others pull out more or less, but you'll find all these elements in a true church. But I think it bears going through this process. As we see Jesus point them out here in just PowerPoint format, we will also see the epistles beginning with the book of Galatians, actually Acts, the historical book there. It will begin and all of this will be borne out in those epistles as they establish the church. So let's begin here in verses 13. The previous say, we've already preached all this. We gave you an overview in the first in the first hour. Why the overview? Why is it so necessary? Some of these passages have so many things going on that unless we we understand the context of the passage itself, it is hard for us to comprehend the truth that he and the significance of that truth that he is teaching in that. This is one of those passages that it would not hurt us to hear once a year at least. That's how significant. I mark this passage in your Bible. Read it frequently because in these ten things, all ten of them apply to us directly. So let's, let's examine the ten things. First of all, we see, remember the context, chapter 14, he feeds the 5,000, primarily Jews. At the end of that, he preaches that whole passage on him being the bread of life, that manna from heaven. Contrast the manna that Moses offered and that specific manna, which the manna was a picture of, and that was the bread of life. The one who came not just take away physical hunger, but he came to satisfy spiritual hunger, to save man from his sins. At the end of which, most of the Jews that followed him left. Pretty much only the twelve and maybe a few others stayed with him. But the vast majority of those crowds abandoned them. Then in chapter 15, we see him go to the 4,000 over the Gentiles in the area of Decapolis. Now, the area of Decapolis is huge. It goes all the way from Damascus, Syria, all the way down to Amman, Jordan. And there are 10 cities in that, in that spectrum on the eastern side of the Jordan River that make up Decapolis. But he was there, and he did that second miracle of the 4,000. And they acclaimed him as the God of Israel, and they worshipped him. A very different response from the Jews. Interesting, the Jews who were long awaiting him and looking for him and saw the miracles, they walked away from him when he preached the message. The Gentiles, when they saw the miracles and ate the bread, they worshipped him and acknowledged him as the God of Israel. Isn't it interesting? The ones with very little knowledge, they received. The ones that had so much knowledge, they weren't interested. Well, we come through to this, and then we come in chapter 16 to this very important discussion. It's a pivotal moment, as we see in verse 21, it, from that time forth. So 
Uh, two, two and a half years into his ministries, this is after the third Passover of his earthly ministry. The next one, he will be crucified. So as he's come two and a half years, he's now going to change his approach. He's not going to be seen as much with crowds, though there will be crowds here and there. Now he's going to focus his time more with the disciples and preparing for that trip to Jerusalem and the trial and all that's going to be entailed there. So as he's doing that, he introduces the church for the first time. And he introduces it with a discussion. Notice, and this is where he, we see those elements that are essential to having a true church. First of all, we see the right confession, verses 13 to 16. And Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi and asked his disciples, Who do, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they answered, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? You twelve, you who have walked with me and seen and heard and sat under my teaching. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now that is a powerful, very packed full of theology confession. So pay, let's examine that for a little bit. It says, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And we could ask that question today. Who do pe people say that Christ is? Well, a true church of Jesus Christ must have the right confession. To miss, you, you can be right on everything else and miss who Christ is, and you will miss eternity in heaven. It doesn't matter all the other things I did. If I do not receive Christ as my Savior, as the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but by him, then I will go to a Christless eternity in the lake of fire. Period. A church is made up of the right confession. What does that mean? This means people who have come face to face with their condition as a sinner, and they have acknowledged Jesus' ministry to come and to seek and save that which was lost, and they reject their own lives, acknowledge they cannot save themselves, and they trust in what he did on Calvary to save them. That is that confession. Thou art the Christ, the Savior, the Messiah. But they, we also acknowledge he is God because apart from him being God, there, he would not be able to do what he did. He would not be qualified. So when he says, there are the Christ, that's the Messiah. The Son of, the Son is, means the second person of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's important to recognize he is the second person of the Trinity. John 1 tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verses 2 and 3 tell us he created all things, and without him, nothing was made that was made. We have to get the confession right. The wrong confession today, we see, we see cults who will say, yeah, Jesus was a man, not God. Others will say he, he is a God. Now, here's the interesting thing about, you say, why the word Trinitarian there? The word Trinitarian means there's one God, Deuteronomy chapter 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is what? One Lord. And thou shalt worship the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. So that means there is one God, and the Bible teaches that all the way through. But from Genesis 1-1, we begin to understand that there is a trinity involved here. So what do you mean? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Yes, that word God is the word Elohim in the Hebrew. That is the plural form of that name. Who is Elohim? That's the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All three are God. They are equal in their deity, in their essence, in their attributes, but yet they're distinct in their functions. Do you understand that? If you do, explain it to me. But it's true. One God, but yet they're expressed in three persons. There's a hierarchy. The Father sent the Son. Later, the Son prayed the Father to send the Holy Spirit. So to acknowledge that he's the son, that me, the, the son of the living God means that he is indeed God. He is deity, not just the Messiah. He is deity. And the living God is an Old Testament term for Jehovah God. So what, what was Peter saying? You are not just the Savior, not just the Messiah. You are God. 
Now, folks, that, that is the confession. When we come to Christ, we're acknowledging he is who he said he was. Now, the temptation to any Bible teacher here is to, to launch out into all these passages that talk about the deity of Christ. That he is who he said he was, the sacrifice that he made. But suffice it to say here, that unless a church has the right confession, that means made up of people who are born again. Say, so, well, preacher, isn't our purpose to, to get all the world into the church so they hear the gospel? No. That's not what a church is. Now, we welcome them to come. And we pray the Spirit of God will show them their need for a Savior and convict their hearts and bring them to a saving knowledge of Christ. But a church is called out ones. Those who have been called out from the world, they have the Spirit of God indwelling them. They comprehend the things of the Lord and we have fellowship. We have all things common. The world does not have things common with us. In fact, the Bible says do not fellowship with the world because you don't have things in common. It disturbs me when people will come to church. But the rest of their week, they have no fellowship with Christians. They find themselves more at ease with unbelievers. That is not a good sign for the health of a Christian. See, the right confession means I acknowledge who he is. And I identify with him. See, churches today, one of the problems in most churches today, they're trying to go the route of contemporary, the route of entertainment, the route of... Making the church dress down, make them bring in worldly music and worldly practices and all these things so that the world, when they walk in, oh, I feel at home here. And maybe we can sneak the gospel in and get them saved without them knowing it. No, they wouldn't say it that way. But you will not find that doctrine in Scripture. The whole thing is thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And whether people acknowledge him or they don't, it doesn't change who he is. To have a church, you have to have the right confession. No confession? Well, that's not a church. If they're not willing to confess Christ as Savior, they're not part of a church. Well, what happens, Pastor, when someone comes in, pretends to be a Christian, and they're not? They get baptized, they're a member of the church, but they're never saved. They're not part of the church. They might be on the roll of members, they might be on paper, but in their hearts they have not been regenerated. They don't, they've not been born again. We have to have the right confession. Secondly, you have to have the right revelation. So Jesus says, who, who do you say that I am? And Peter, of course, he speaks for the group, says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 17, Jesus says, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah, bar Jonah, that's what it means. For flesh and blood hath not revealed them. This didn't come from human knowledge. It didn't come from human teaching. But my Father which is in heaven, he revealed that to you, Peter. Peter probably, as he said, says, where did that come from? Well, that, it came from where this comes from. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means it is God-breathed. Not just the words, not just the topics, the whole thing. It is completely inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction of righteousness, for correction, that we might be made whole, a, a mature man in Christ, a mature woman in Christ. But we have to have the right revelation. There are a lot of people today that will come up with, they've come up with other books that yes, this is another gospel of Jesus Christ, or this is another writing that you must do. And what they do is they put that writing above the scriptures. I've talked to many of them over the years, and I've confronted them about that issue of adding to the scriptures. And they said, no, no, see, the Bible was corrupted. Oh, the, the Bible is correct only insofar as it, is, as it is correctly translated. And I stopped the man one time and said, do you know Greek or Hebrew? He said, no, 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 I don't know that. I'm not a scholar. I said, then let's not talk about translations. He says, I do know a little bit of Greek, not much Hebrew. But I said, you're not an authority, but yet you're speaking. You, and their church happens to print millions of, of King James Bibles and distributes them all over English-speaking world. I said, your church prints it and distributes it, so let's stick with that. 
That's the older brother. In other words, the new, the new revelation you got comes after it. Let's stick with that revelation that has been tried and tested and true. And let's measure everything by that. Then there are others that come up with their own writings, many different books. And you go to different religions and cults and, and even in evangelical Christianity. You'll find on one extreme of the spectrum, the legalists like the Pharisees, who will add to the scriptures and add on and add on things you must do in order to please God. Or the other spectrum of liberalism, you start to take away the things. That, well, there's no real resurrection. There's real, no literal heaven, no literal hell, and start to diminish the scriptures. You say, well, we're not on those. But let me tell you what's happening in churches like ours. They started out one day as fundamental Bible-believing churches. And they come to a point where they start to say, well, you know, we don't want to preach anymore out of Revelation because that scares people. Prophecy scares them. They're afraid of those things that are to come. But there's only one reason to be afraid of it. It's because you're not walking with the Lord or you don't know the Lord. Because that is the hope of the believer, not the fear of the believer. When you know the Lord, you know that the rapture, I mean, that's, imagine that. You don't go through all the pain and dying process. You're absent from the body in one instant and present with the Lord. What a transformation. We have our glorified bodies never to get sick again. That shouldn't cause us fear. And all the things that follow should not cause us fear. The reason people fear it is because they don't want to hear what the Lord has to say. There are others that won't preach on hell. It scares people away. We want them to come. Well, they need to hear the whole counsel of God. Paul told the Ephesian pastors as he was preparing to go, he knew he would die. He told these pastors, this is the last time I want to see you, but I want you to preach the whole counsel of God. Don't ever shun to preach the whole counsel of God. Because that is the task of every preacher. The right revelation. First of all, it's not of human or origin. Heaven, uh, blood, flesh and blood didn't give that to you. My Father which is in heaven gave it to you. Notice it's also personal. Simon, we called him by name. The Lord Led you, Simon, you're the leader of the twelve. You twelve are going to be the leaders of the church as you establish it. And do you see how God can give you the illumination, the understanding you need to rightly interpret the word of God and rightly proclaim the word of God? Wow. They weren't even indwelt by the Spirit of God yet. They're walking with Jesus, pretty much close to the same thing. But this won't happen yet for another year and a month, more or less. It's from heaven. The word of God. This, everything in your life will come on the question of what you say about the word of God. If you see it as the word of God and it's your final authority for your faith and practice, then that will change your life. If you don't, then you will live accordingly. How do you know? Well, Matthew 7 tells us, by their fruits you shall know them. By what we do, we testify of what our heart condition is. Well, we need the right confession, the right revelation. We need the right foundation. Verse 18, Jesus says, and I say also, I'm going to give you more, Peter. Thou art Peter, Petros, a movable stone. And upon this Petra, an unmovable stone. Every time I read that, I think of the Rock of Gibraltar. You know that picture they put up there? Because it's unmovable. As I've traveled through Lebanon, and I, I, I go up Beirut, on up towards an area called Mansourie. It's a Christian section outside of Beirut. That it, you, you go up and you see on the, there's this huge drop and a huge rise on the other side. And then you see these tall apartment buildings, 10, 15 stories tall, right on the edge of a cliff. I'm talking on the edge of the cliff. And I think, what if an earthquake comes through here? But they are grounded on solid rock because it's all rock. Beautiful scenery. But that's the idea here of a foundation. Peter, you're a movable stone. And you're going to be critical in the establishing of the church. 
But I want you to understand that I am Petra. Upon this rock, he was pointing, he was pointing to himself, speaking of himself. This is the foundation where I will build my church, the first mention of church in the New Testament. You don't find the church in the Old Testament, a mystery in the Old Testament. Up until now, it's been a mystery. He began to introduce the concept in Matthew 13. But now he declares, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, this tells us a lot of things. Number one, the foundation is Christ. That's the unmovable foundation of the church. So that tells me that no matter how society changes, no matter how culture changes, no matter how the winds and change of time change, his word doesn't change. It says heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will not pass. It says it will not change until it's all fulfilled. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that is the foundation of the church. We don't need to wake up tomorrow morning and figure out how to reinvent the church. It has the right foundation. If you, we're not going to take the time, but if you want to jot down Ephesians 2, verses 16 to 22, that's where Paul, in this epistle, he explains the transition between the law and grace and what God is building now out of Jews and Gentiles, one body, the church. And how that that is the foundation. And that he is the chief cornerstone. That goes back to the architecture in Bible times. They would perfectly cut the cornerstone. And that would be laid perfectly. And every other brick, every other stone, movable stone, would be laid in relation to that one. For being square, for being straight, for being plumb. But you had to get that first one perfect and that's why he's called the chief cornerstone of the church he's the head of that church so we see the foundation any church is founded upon any other man and we see brother darren and i were talking between services the whole basis of one religion is they misunderstand this verse and they think peter is the pope and the foundation of the church and that he can get new revelations that change what god has said in the past and to this day they believe this they can add to the word of God. They can change the word of God. At one time, one religion taught that black people could not get saved. And then later came back to say, now they can. God's word never said that. He wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He loves the whole world, irregardless of our skin color nationality, education level, societal level. He wants all to come to the knowledge of truth. The church needs the right foundation. And a lot of foundations that are out there today is, all right, let's find out what the people want. Let's build a church based on what the people want. That is not a church. As you'll see in a moment, that is satanic. It is in opposition to the purpose and plan of God. It needs the right victory. It says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now we, we see the scripture shows us two things. First of all, gates are defensive instruments, which suggests the church, as it marches forth and it proclaims the gospel of Christ, we're not demonstrating over political matters. We're not de demonstrating over uh, social matters. We're not out there proclaiming all these other things. We're proclaiming one thing, the message of the gospel of Christ. That is the church's mission. It's only one mission. We're not a political organization. Nowhere. Jesus could have preached many things. He didn't do that. He focused on the one purpose for which God sent him, and he passed that purpose on to his disciples. So what are we doing as we preach? We are snatching literally souls from the lake of fire. And hell is trying with all its might to prevent those people to, from coming to Christ. But the church cannot be stopped as it marches forward, as it goes, sent by the Lord under his authority, under his power, indwelt by his spirit, and armed with his gospel. Hell cannot stop it. We don't need to fear the devil in that sense. We don't challenge him because we have no power to defeat him, but the one who's working in us does if we will yield to him. 
But it's also an offensive battle. The Bible, Jesus tells us in, in John chapter 17, as he prays for his disciples, that the world's going to hate us. He's going to per persecute us. He prayed not only for those 12, but for those who would hear and come to follow Christ, which includes you and me here today. He prayed for us. Not that God would take us out of the world, but he would keep us in the world and accomplish through us what he wants to accomplish. Romans 8 tells us who can separate us from the love of Christ. It goes to a whole list of things, powers, principalities, and all these other things. He says none of these things shall separate us from the love of God. We are more than victors. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us the resurrection chapter because of Christ. So we have the right confession, we have the right revelation, we have the right foundation, the right victory, but we also need the right authority. Authority is foundational for anything we do. As kids, we'd say, one of our siblings or somebody would say, you've got to do this. You say, who says? If you're saying it, I don't have to do it. You don't tell me what to do. Well, mom says, oh, okay, we better say it. We were having a discussion about, you know, when they called you by one name, when they called you by another name, when they called me by all three names, I knew I was, I'd better do it. And when my mom would call me by all my brothers and sisters' names before she got to mine because she was that outdone, I knew I was in trouble at that point. Well, we have to have an authority. Too many people today are getting upset with the church. Well, I don't like what they're doing there. I don't like the way they did this. I don't like the way they did that. And I'm going to leave and go find me another church. And sometimes they don't find another church. So what do they do? They say, we're going to start a church. Who gave us the authority to start a church? You see, he is the head of the church. It is under his authority that we start a church. We have to be very careful the source of that authority, look in verse 19. It says, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Keys, notice who gives it, first of all, that authority. It's I will give, the Lord Jesus. The only authority we as Christians have to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ is as we are aligned with him who is the truth. We say, the scripture says this. God's word says this. That is the only authority that I have as a preacher. If I stand up here and say, well, I think this, well, my thinking and my opinion means no more than yours does. It's just a matter of how closely our opinion lines up with the word of God. And if you want any authority, you say, well, this is what the word of God says. That is my authority. There is no higher authority. In fact, there is no other authority. It's given by the Lord. The scope is the kingdom of heaven. The, the kingdom of heaven, I won't go back through the whole discussion, but remember there's the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Some believe there's no distinction, but scripture does single out some things in certain passages. The kingdom of heaven is a broader term. We find that in Matthew 13, that in the end, in the judgment, there will be some that identified as followers of Christ, but were never saved. Those are the tares that were sown in the midst by the devil. And in the end, rather than try to take it out while it was growing, he says, you'll pull out wheat with the tares. He said, let them grow. And in the end, he will send the angels and they will separate the wheat from the tares. The tares will be burned. The wheat will be put into the barns. And that parable was to illustrate how this time would be. And the kingdom of heaven is that broader term. The kingdom of God generally refers only to those who are truly born again. So when he says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom, authority in the kingdom of heaven, that means they are given the authority of God to go and preach this gospel. The gospel of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching on the church, the, the teaching on the church is a mystery in the Old Testament. So what authority do they have? God gave them authority. I'm going to give you the keys. You will have the authority to speak. And notice what he says here. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever is loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And this is where some of those religions get the idea that, aha, we've been given the keys, we have the authority, we have the Pope, and we can change the word of God, and whatever we say, he's going to do in heaven too. 
And that's a whole misunderstanding of all of this. God is not our bellboy to where he has to submit to whatever we say. We are the servants. He is the Lord. We conform ourselves to what he tells us. As these apostles go forth and preach, filled with the Holy Ghost, submitting to the Holy Ghost, they have the authority and the message. That means as they preach the gospel of Christ, if you will repent, you have everlasting life. Your sins are forgiven you. Who are you to say your sins are forgiven you? Remember back in that house when Jesus was speaking, they lowered that paralytic man down through the roof. And Jesus looked at him and says, your sins are forgiven you. He didn't heal him. He said, your sins are forgiven you. Because he saw his faith and that of the ones that lowered him down. You remember what the Pharisees and scribes who were in that room said? Thinking to themselves, who is he to forgive sin? Only God can forgive sin, remember? And they were right. What he was saying right there is, I am God. And so he knows what they're saying, and he says this, is it easier for me to say your sins are forgiven you, which you can't verify? You can't ex exteriorly verify that his sins are forgiven. Only God knows. Is it easier for me to say that, or is it easier for me to say to him, get up, take up your bed, and go home? Only God could do that. But they can verify this so that you might believe that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins on earth. He said to the man, you get up, you take up your bed and go home. And he did. So they saw visually that he had the power of God and understood then that he had the power to forgive sins. And as you and I go and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, and as those 12 did, and they said, your sins will be forgiven you. What authority do you have to say that? The authority of Jesus Christ. Because he said this. And so we have that authority. We preach his word. And whatever, you, you reject the gospel message, then it's, it's bound here on earth. It's bound there in heaven. You can tell them, you are not saved. You're going to hell if you don't repent. What authority do you have to say that? The word of God. It's not my authority. What authority do you have to tell someone, your sins are forgiven. You're on your way to heaven. The word of God. It's that simple. So we conform ourselves to his plan. We have the right authority, but also we need the right perspective. What do I mean by perspective? Look at verse 20. And this is, this is another, this passage is full of complicated verses, isn't it? Verse 20 says, Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Wait a second. If you days or weeks ago, you sent us out into all the surrounding towns to preach the gospel of the kingdom, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, preach the kingdom of heaven. We're supposed to go tell everybody that you're the Messiah. And now you're telling us to tell no man that you're the Messiah? What's going on here, Jesus? Well, you need to understand the context. He has already established himself as the Messiah, his power over Sin over sickness, over the elements, over nature, over demons. He had already shown that he could do only the things that God could do. He already showed that his wisdom over the scriptures were far exceeded that of the greatest experts of his day. And they still rejected him. And he said at this point, they have had the gospel presented to the Jews first, then to the Gentiles, but now... Verse 21 says he's, he began to prepare to go to Calvary. It says there's a bigger priority right now. They've had that opportunity. Now our focus is going to be to prepare you and to prepare me for what needs to happen at Calvary to fulfill what God began back in Genesis chapter 3, the promise of the Redeemer. But the perspective has to be this. He was going to go to Jerusalem. The Lamb of God. That's where it had to be offered, remember? That's the only place they could offer the sacrifices. The Lamb had to be without blemish, had to be perfect. And they were pictures of the Lord Jesus. And he would die on that cross for our sins. He had to suffer many things according to the scriptures. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he rose again the third day. The whole perspective here is, 
Yes, humanly speaking, we would say, no, we need to convince the Sadducees and the Pharisees. We need to go to these masses. I mean, if we got 5,000, I believe we can get a bigger crowd next time. That wasn't the purpose. So we need to have the right perspective and align ourselves with what God is trying to accomplish. Sometimes there will be points when you preach and you preach and you preach, and at some point you shake the dust off your feet and walk away because the, there are others who will receive. You need to go to others. Does that mean they're done? No. I've seen people that have done that for decades still come to Christ. But we have to have the right perspective and understand that, that Jesus and the Lord will sometimes lead us in ways that we don't understand. Paul, Acts chapter, I believe it's 14 or 16, he had finished his ministry in uh, Galatia. And he was going into Asia, a big area that needed Christ. And the Spirit said, no, don't want you to go there. Well, Lord, you called me to preach. These people need the gospel. You said to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. And the Spirit said, no. Okay, Lord, I won't go to Asia. Well, Bithynia up here, they need the gospel. I said, I'll go to, no, you're not going to Bithynia. Lord, down here is the Mediterranean Sea. What am I supposed to do? So he goes down and he's down there at the port city. And he has the dream of the Macedonian call, come over to Macedonia and help us. And they knew that the Lord was directing them not to Asia, not to Bithynia. But do you know what I thought when I read that passage? What about the Asians and the Bithynians? They need the gospel. What you don't see is that later down there in the gospel, in the epistle of Peter, when he had to leave Jerusalem for his life, the Lord directed him over there to Asia and to Bithynia to preach. See, God has his plan. He has his timing. We need to have the right perspective and discernment to follow along with that. Well, Peter struggled with that. Look at verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and to be killed and then be raised again the third day. Now, nobody wanted to hear that. They knew the scriptures. They knew the prophecies. But yet, they had somehow blocked it out of their minds. Says, okay, he's, he's going to establish the kingdom. He's going to do this. And when he said, no, I'm, I'm going to die, just like it's been prophesied for hundreds of years. That is God's plan. He has a plan. He has a purpose. And we must align. A church must align its perspective with God's perspective with his purpose and his plan. The purpose of the church is not to have the greatest attendance. In fact, he said, wide is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be that go in thereat. Narrow is the gate that leads to life and few there be that find it. Don't expect the followers of Jesus Christ to be in the majority. Don't expect them to be in the masses. That's a perspective that's going to drive most away. We need the right discipline. Look at verse 21. I'm going to touch on the next two, and then we'll come back and finish this up next time. It says, he t Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, verse 22. Now imagine this, the king of glory comes, he's the Messiah, he is the living word of God, and here's Peter. Again, the one who made that great confession a few verses ago, he now takes the Lord aside and says, okay, Lord, let me, let me straighten you out on a few things. This is not going to happen. I've got my sword here, and we're going to protect you. You're not going to be killed. They're not going to... Don't you worry about that. We'll just stay out of Jerusalem. There are other places that need you. Now, do you believe Peter was trying here to play into the hand of Satan? I don't. Do you believe here he had the intent to oppose the plan and work of God? I don't. In fact, I believe he was sincere and he was thinking of how much good they could do by keeping Jesus alive and reach more and more people with the gospel. That is what I believe was in his heart. His heart was pure in its motives, but as sincere and as pure as his intents may have been, he was wrong. It's that simple. We have, as Christians, 
we must be disciplined to do things God's way. In his plan, we have his perspective, and we discipline ourselves to follow his purpose, his plan, his way. That's simple. And when we don't do this, then Jesus turns and says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Whoa, Lord, you called me blessed are thou Simon Barjona a few verses ago. Where's the blessed part now? Now I'm Satan? That means adversary, one who opposes any church that stands against the purposes of God for the church is a satanic church. It can have Baptist in its name. It can have any name. It can preach from the same Bible and sing the same hymns and look the same way we do, but if it opposes the purpose and work of God, it stands in opposition. It becomes an adversary. Now Peter, he's, he's one of the greatest of the disciples. He became one of the greatest of the apostles, fundamental in establishing the church and writing portions of the scripture, but at this moment in time, he allowed himself to be used to stand against the purpose of God for Christ. What do you do when that happens? Well, notice what he did. He said, get thee behind me. That should be our attitude toward those friends, associates, people that would take us from where we know God wants us to be. We say, whoa, okay. We're going to have to put some distance between us because my purpose is to follow him. I'm aligning myself with him. That's my perspective. And if you want me to go and do things that do not align with what God wants for me, then I'm going to stick with him and I'm going to distance myself from you. And that's what Jesus was telling Peter here. If you're not, going to, if you're not with me, you get behind me. Get away from me. Call it what it is. It says, thou art an offense to me. That's the word scandalon in the Greek from which we get scandal, scandalous. It means to be a stumbling block. Something that's put there to trip up the plan and purposes of God. It can be anything. It can be riches. It can be status. It can be a relationship. It can be a religion. It can be a church. It can be a job. Anything that stands between you and the obedience to the Lord and fulfilling his purpose for you, it is a scandal. It is a stumbling block. And notice he goes on to say one more thing. Jesus said, you need to savor the things of God. He said to Peter, you don't savor those things. There are three definitions to that word savorist. The word phroneo, which first of all means to have understanding or be wise. It means to feel or think. To direct one's mind to a thing to seek to strive for. It says, you're not seeking or striving for the things of God, Peter, but the things of men. When a church tries to please men over the Lord, and they're willing to sacrifice the standards of the, of, of the Lord, things that please Him for the sake of drawing and, and bringing the acceptance of men, they're not savoring the things of God but the things of men. That is one of the big problems. And many that are calling themselves churches today, and they're not churches, because they do not align themselves with the purpose of the Lord. You don't dim your light so that it doesn't shine too brightly for the world, and so they feel at home in the church. The church is made up of born-again believers with that right confession. When they come, they should be confronted with their sin and with their need for salvation, and if not, with their destiny in a place called the lake of fire. That is what the church is called to do inside the building when we gather and out in our daily lives as we walk for the Lord. We have to have the right discipline. We have to discern and see and think and strive for the things of God and not the things of men. But everybody's doing this, preacher. All the, it doesn't matter. If they are misaligning themselves with Christ and the purpose of God, they are wrong. Period. Why? Because you said so? No. Because God word, God's word says so. It's that simple. Well, what's the right disciple? I'm not going to preach through that one now, but let me just mention three things, very simple. Think about it. We'll come back and talk about it more 
on Wednesday. Verse 24 says, Jesus said unto his disciples, all of them, it says, if any man will come after me, you want to be a follower of Christ? You want to be a Christian? Deny yourself first. How do I deny myself? Go back and read Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12, the Beatitudes. Those godly attitudes, righteous attitudes that God expects. It says, if you can't do this, the Pharisees don't do this, and they're the most righteous standard that men held at that point in time. It says, you've got to get higher than that if you're going to see the kingdom of heaven. And it starts with those attitudes there. That's denying ourselves. Take up your cross. That's our duty, our ministry. That's more than just mere inconveniences. That is taking up that cross, and it's your cross, his cross. There is a cross for each of us to bear, and they are not the same crosses. Some of us will suffer persecution. Others will suffer in other ways. But all of us, as we live for Christ, we have a cross to bear for him. You take up that cross that he has for you, and then you follow him. That's our direction. If I'm following Jesus when other friends and other things go a different way, I'm still following Jesus. And that's our direction. That, that, that is what the right disciple is. To have a, ch a church, a true church, you have to have right disciples. So we've looked so far at the right confession, the right revelation, the right foundation, the right victory, the right authority, the right perspective, and the right disciplines. And we'll come back and look at the other three. And as you can see, I'm just hitting the high point. If we go and then study through the epistles and we can do this and spend one or more messages on every one of these ten topics and it will bear out through the preaching and teaching of the apostles what Jesus told them here in this passage. But I don't know how the Lord is applying this to your heart. I don't know what conviction he's bringing to you. I know that I take a beating when I prepare messages. You think, well, do you fulfill it? No. I, I've got an old nature, and I'm a sinner too. And I struggle every day to walk for the Lord and with temptations and all these things. All of us will until the day he takes us out of here. But the more we grow and the more we measure ourselves by the word of God, the more it becomes a daily walk, and it becomes more and more a habit to walk with him. And it becomes easier and easier as the days go by. It doesn't mean we're not going to be persecuted. In fact, we'll, be, we'll suffer persecution. If we want to be a true church of Jesus Christ, and that means individual members and collectively, we need these ten things. So go and study that a little further. I gave you the outline so that if you didn't see the rest, you've got, you've got the basics there. But I hope you'll be back Wednesday, and we'll try to finish this. Let's pray. Father, as we close the service this morning we thank you that you sent your son not only to confirm all that had been written in the old testament and to put his seal of approval upon that but lord to fulfill those old testament scriptures and then to introduce to us what would be coming in short order from that perspective of that day and time today lord we're looking back over two thousand years of history of the church and we see the fulfillment of all that Jesus has said for the good and for the bad. Your word has fulfilled itself to the letter and it continues to do so and will. Lord, I pray that as your church individually, first of all, Lord, we need to be disciples with a true confession, truly born again, true followers of Christ, bound for heaven. If there's a soul here today that does not yet know you, Convict that heart, bring them to you. And then, Lord, as believers, give us those right qualities that are essential for your church to be what you have designed it to be. May we submit to your direction, to your will, and to your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen.